-hmm. Yesterday I was speaking with one of our patrons and he brought up John Tasker, friend of the show. And I was like, yeah, that's his real name. He's like, no, but what's his real name? And I was like, his real name is John Tasker, friend of the show. That's his real name. (laughs) And he was like, wait, what? Yeah, his real name is John Tasker, friend of the show. That's his real name. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's and he, he he keeps just adding things at the end of his at the end of his name. Like he just has so many last names at this point. His, I, I mean, I heard I heard recently his real name is John Tasker, friend of the show. Yes, that's real. That's his real name. Yes, that's his real name. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast contains explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Thundercast. My name is Christian. My name is Lucas. And I'm Liam, here with another podcast that just talks about movies. That's right. Today we are coming alive from Skywalker Ranch, but we have to be quiet, otherwise George will hear us. I don't, I don't want, want George to hear us. I, I really don't want him to send Ray Park from the back over there to come beat us. <laughs> he keeps him in a cage. <laughs> He's a dangerous man. Don't let him out. He forces Ray Park to wear the Darth Maul suit all day. <laughs> and carry the Donatello saber. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, so He's today, always in the makeup. <laughs> today we are going to be talking about good directors that have gone bad. So don't let George know. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty much the setup for this show. Thank you for watching the Action-a-thon, which was maybe a little bit too long. Oh, I forgot. I gotta thank our sponsors. Our sponsor yes. for the show today is our patrons, and every single one of you will receive a shout-out at the end of the show. Um, but yeah, for now, we're gonna jump into the ingestion. Who would like to go first? I'm volunteering Liam. <laughs> well, I was gonna suggest you and I go last, because we have a, uh, there's a bit of an overlap between us. I'm volunteering I, Lucas. All right, I will the go then. You, and one of the things you and I are going to talk about, Christian, is probably a good segue into the meat of everything. That's a good, good point, yeah. Volunteering Lucas, then. All right. Uh, first thing on my list is I watched season four of Netflix's Castlevania, mm-hmm. um, which is a show that I have been a fan of for basically since it came out. Um, mostly, like, the animation style. I really love uh, the, the art and the aesthetic and the characters and everything. Uh, season four was the final season um and uh you can tell they kind of had to rush uh because they they probably were like oh yeah season four is the last one they're like ah fuck um (laughs) (laughs) they also had a problem with uh i wouldn't be surprised if the shit with warren ellis contributed to the production in some way yeah yeah that probably probably probably, uh hampered things as well um it wasn't bad i don't want to say it's bad it's just uh the first half is very very slow not a lot happens and of then the, the fourth second... season yeah first half yeah. of the fourth season okay yeah and then the second half everything happens very very quickly the pacing in the season was uh not very good <laughs> uh but there's still some really stellar animation some parts looked a little cheaper uh than maybe they were before but uh there's this one fight scene uh about halfway through the season when stuff actually starts to pick up that is just absolutely beautiful, mm-hmm. which is weird to say because it involves a lot of blood. Uh, <laughs> but like, um, there's two people fighting. I'm not going to give away who they are, but there's one person wearing all red and one person wearing all blue, and they're they're fighting in like this very flashy anime style, and the ground is all red because it's just covered in blood because this was a uh, like there's been a lot of fighting in this area. And just from an aesthetic point of view, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, and there's like old blood and stuff there. It's not just like all, all fresh fl- blood, fresh blood. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's like this bright, bright red floors. One person's in bright red clothing. Another person's in bright blue clothing. And it just the stark uh, colors. Just it, it's, it, it's beautiful. Um, let's not, again, that, let's not let blood. the RCMP hear this. <laughs> <laughs> blood is beautiful. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> on the um, CBC to the CBC News tonight, Lucas has been arrested, arrested, and revealed to have killed seventy-one people. <laughs> oh God! I feel like that's low. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, the end of the season is is fine. Uh, there's a lot of kind of contrivances to get them there, and there's some kind of silly story points and some. Uh, uh, dumb coincidences but um it was it's probably the weakest season of the show in my opinion yeah. which is unfortunate but it was it was fine it wasn't that bad well it's also 
it kind of contributes to a kind of brings up a larger issue that I've seen recently, which is endings have been really hard lately, like harder than usual. And like ev- nobody seems to be nobody lately has seemed to have figured out how to end things. Yeah, writing endings is really, really difficult in the first place. Um, but Satisfying like, endings. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think Liam has kind of touched on this a little bit in the past, but like, uh, at least at least in the way Hollywood tells stories nowadays, things are supposed to just kind of keep going so they can just keep making money. And so they, they, they write... I, I feel like part of the problem of season four is season three. And I really liked season three, but season three does not start to set up the end right so they so they have to set up set up the end and end the show in one season when they it it didn't feel like they're leading up to the end of the story in the previous season Mm -hmm. um which i think is unfortunate but overall i i I did enjoy it for the most part uh not as much as previous seasons but it was it was pretty good uh as for other stuff um I have been playing a lot of Mass Effect Legendary Edition. <laughs> I'm waiting for this all day. I'm waiting for this conversation all day. This is true. Um, I am a huge fan of the Mass Effect trilogy. Uh, I don't really care much for Andromeda, personally. Um, but Mass Effects 1 through 3 are... It's my favorite game trilogy of all time. Mass Effect 2 being my favorite, one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and I finished Mass Effect 1 recently at like 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. Because usually I play till like two or something and then go to bed. And then I'm like, I'm almost to the end. I'm just going to go. Uh, played till late in the morning. That's worth it. Um, <laughs> it was. It was. And Mass Effect 1 has been so greatly improved by the, by the Legendary Edition. I don't know if either of you have played any Mass Effect. But Mass Effect 1, while the story and characters are a lot of fun, the gameplay can be kind of a deal breaker right because obviously this is right. a video game gameplay is going to be really important um it's very clunky and slow and it can be frustrating at times um and at least in the original version uh especially if you're spend a lot, a lot of time driving the mako mm-hmm. which is like a, a big tank type thing and that thing handles like shit it's not um, is it as bad as uh, some of the early halo tanks were uh, I have not played that early Halo games much, so yeah. I can't really can't really say. Sometimes I would say they suck, I, they suck really bad. <laughs> yeah, the thing about the Mako is it doesn't feel like it weighs anything, despite it being like a tank. Mm. So, and you're always driving on these really poorly designed, like terrain maps, and it's and like sometimes you're like going up a hill and like you've gone up hills that are this steep before, but now for some reason you can't go up this hill anymore. Uh, and like uh, you go over a hill, like with barely any speed and you just catch so much air <laughs> and then you, then you land and then you flip over and then it's, 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 it's a disaster. But is that, does that from planet to planet or is that on the same planet often? Because I could understand if they uh, were depends. trying to like emulate like, Oh, if you're on a different, different. planet, then different gravity. Yeah. I don't think they, emulated the gravity like i don't think they changed the the gravity settings on any planets fair enough like it operates the same on like a big planet as it does earth's moon right um but the legendary edition has has fixed uh most of that the mako still kind of sucks to drive it, it it's much better but um it's still it still drives in the direction that you point with the mouse um or the control stick uh, but it also has a gun on top. Oh, so like you you can't is that a new you can, is that a new thing? No, you you always had weapons on it. Um, but like, you know how in most games when you're driving a, a vehicle with a weapon, the the vehicle drives in the direction of your joystick or or your WASD keys, right? And you use the mouse to kind of look around. In the Mako, it's all dependent on the mouse. <laughs> oh no and it's really annoying which you you can strafe and kind of like do that but you have to like it's always moving in the direction the mako always moves in the direction uh according to your screen so if you if like uh your screen is facing towards like a hill and you're or like towards a monster you're fighting and you want to shoot towards it you have to hold the d key or move like uh left or right instead of like just holding it forward and using the other stick or your mouse to shoot and control and right it's it's it, it's, it's strange it takes a while to get used to and it's uh, a little weird so, but, so you um, you only ever play using your mouse and keyboard hey you don't have a gamepad yeah. yeah 
No, yeah, I have one, but I I I, I prefer mouse and keyboard personally. Fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, the story is basically the same. The story's completely the same, actually. <laughs> I um, hope so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, but I mean, um, <laughs> it's 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 much easy. It's so much easier to get into and get invested in when you're not like, oh god, now I have to play the game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And yeah, it, it like I would say with the legendary edition, this playthrough of Mass Effect One is my favorite Mass Effect uh, One experience that I've had. I was gonna say I don't think I've ever played I've ever played Mass Effect. I, played, I, I love I love them. I think I played half of the first one, but yeah, mm. pr- that was pretty much the reason because I was just so infuriated by the the gameplay. Yeah, well, I remember uh, we were at a con one year, Christian, and we were meeting uh, some guy who was voice acting in Mass Effect. Yeah, we met Shepard. Yeah, uh, Mark Mark Mir played the male she- male version of Shepard, and Jennifer Hale uh, played the female version yeah. of Shepard. We met Man Shep. Man Shep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not um, yet. Yeah, and it, it it also reminded me how starkly different Mass Effect One and Mass Effect Two are because I've started playing Mass Effect Two, but I'm just sort of only a couple hours in. Right. Um, Mass Effect Two is so much brighter and has so much more humor, and is much more directional than Mass Effect One. It, it's still like it's still like non-linear in that like you can choose which missions you go on, but like missions are much more straightforward. Uh, there's much more exploration in Mass Effect 1 than there is in Mass Effect 2. Because uh, Mass Effect 1 is a sprawling space opera um, where you're chasing a, a villain across the galaxy, trying to catch up to him, trying to learn what he's after and stop his plans and stuff. Mass Effect 2 is like basically a straight-up heist movie where you spend most of the, most of the game uh, building your team and upgrading your shit so you can go do this one mission. Um, and Mass Effect Three is kind of the the the, the climax of, of the story, where you're actually fighting uh, the main threat. Right. Um, I'll, I'll definitely be talking about Mass Effect in future episodes since I've only finished the first one. Right. Uh, but Mass Effect One with the Legendary Edition, highly recommend. It was uh, it was a great time. And you can't buy them individually, right? You have not to with buy the, them. with the Legendary Edition. It's all one package. Right. But like, uh, if if you're looking at like uh, the bang for your buck sort of thing the legendary edition is a pretty good deal because it's like it's like 80 bucks is the price of a new game but you get three games and almost all of the dlc that came with those games right and so uh, a, can it be played on console or only on computer uh, i believe it's i believe it's on console i don't know if it's on the playstation though I'm not really sure uh while you guys talk about your ingestion i, I will look, look that um, up um but i uh sorry did you have something to say um, I was going to say, just when you brought up the whole space opera thing and as well as the heist thing in space, I was like, okay, I'm a fan of both genres. And when you put them <laughs> in space, I'm pretty into it. There you go. Perfect. And like, in my opinion, at least the best part of Mass Effect is after you finish a mission, you just go check up on all your crew members, on only like your squad mates and you just talk to them. They have they have all these great stories. One of them actually, actually like sings at you at one point. No, oh, really? <laughs> Is like you learn like he's this he's this like scientist um is like he, he's like this brutal doctor scientist character um but like at some point you learn he was in a gilbert and sullivan production hmm. <laughs> is that garris no that is uh that would be morden oh. morden solis oh, okay garris vicarian is is the best bro you could ever have though right um I, or, I follow, or your, what was that i follow this girl on tiktok tiktok who simps over him like all the time oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah if you play femship you can romance him in the second one Ooh. yeah is that everything lucas uh no i'm i have a little Ooh, bit more yeah. uh, i finished uh firekeeper's daughter the book i was i was listening to um it was really good it was not my thing personally mm. uh but i did i did enjoy it for the most part um I don't really have that much more to say about it. I think I said pretty much everything last time. <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> but uh, I, I listened to another book called The, the House in the Cerulean Sea, um, which is the best way I can think to describe it is it's 1984 meets the X-Men, but it's a fairy tale. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. That sounds ca- that sounds kind of cool, actually. It, it was pretty good. Like it, it's not it's not an action story or anything like that. There's there's little to no violence, but like basically. There's this character named Linus Baker. He is uh, the equivalent of a social worker, except for magical youth. And he gets sent on this highly, highly classified um, uh, assignment where he's supposed to evaluate this one orphanage with, for magical youth. Um, and he goes and he does that. And 
he kind of goes through this experience where he like uh uh starts because of because of the kids and because of the master of the orphanage he starts to kind of question like the way things ran where he worked and like start starts to become kind of a bit of a father figure to these kids uh it's very lighthearted and very fun but does tackle some uh pretty heavy issues it's mostly about prejudice right the thing right um i don't don't really want uh as far as i know no this is it's fairly recent it's it's by tj clune um it's very good i really like it uh i i would i would recommend it and last thing is i am about halfway through john green's new book the anthropocene review oh yeah uh mostly so far it has been the same this one uh that one oh, yeah. yeah oh my my screen's not mirrored okay sorry Carry no it, oh, it's 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 no uh, not but not for the read. audience sorry yeah so i gotta fix no, that, that for they, myself I could, I could read it no but i'm recording the OBS. oh right you're recording your perspective yeah. yes yes my bad um and so far, uh, I've been enjoying it, but so far it has mostly been the essays from the podcast. So I've kind of heard most of it. It right. hasn't been much new. Um, but I, I, I'm a big fan of the podcast, so I've been enjoying listening to it. Cool. There, and that's it. All righty. Right uh, I'll go next. Uh, so I've also seen and watched uh, and read many things recently. Uh, first and foremost was I finally had the opportunity to watch Shoot Him Up um, <laughs> with Liam and a friend of ours over the Discord. And it's so dumb. It's so dumb. <laughs> but it's like the right kind of dumb, you know, where it. the other thing is that that movie doesn't stop. It It is, it is constantly moving forward. It's only 90 minutes or so. Um, it's like a it's like an hour 24 or something like that. And there is no stopping. And when even when it does stop, uh, uh, Clive Owen is just still tucking really fast and everything's moving really fast. And, oh, i got to grab, grab a carrot. You know? And then he kills two guys with carrots. Anyway, I don't have much else to say beside of it other than I liked it. And if you haven't seen Shoot Him Up, I think now is probably the time. It, it, it's been long enough. Um, I also watched a uh, small film um, written by... Uh, Kristen Wiig, and it's called Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. Um, it's a comedy, uh, but it's a very offbeat, absurdist kind of thing. Where basically Kristen Wiig and she and the person, other person who wrote the movie, I can't remember what her name is, but the two of them uh, go. They're kind of midwestern um, busybodies, you know. They kind of talk like this, right? Ooh, you know that kind of thing, and like really high pitched voices and. And whatnot. And at first, you're like, oh man, I'm going to hate everything about this, like their voices and, and whatnot. But then you really start to love the character. Wait, you're going to hate voices like that when you love Fargo? It It's different. It's different. Yeah, and I, was... I know what you're comparing it to, but it is different because the, the, right. just their personalities and stuff at first seem like, oh, okay. But then it starts to get really grating and then immediately kind of flips on itself because it becomes incredibly absurd and incredibly silly. I mean, it's already really silly right off the top. But then as the movie kind of carries on, basically the premise is, is there are two mid- Midwestern women who get fired from their job and they live together and they decide to go on a vacation to this place called Vista Del Mar, which is in Florida. And so they take their trip down to Florida and then you find out slowly that there's this evil plot to destroy the town that's going on that they have to stop. Um, anyway, it's, it's pretty good. It's not a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but what it did remind me of is you know how in like the early Austin Powers movies, there'd be really weird sight gags that are just, in, they're not a reference to anything. They're just incredibly absurd. Um, and you're like, that, why am I laughing so hard at this joke? That's not a rep. It's incredibly original. That's what I should say. It's an incredible, like the jokes are original. Some of them are just like, there's this one bit where there's this small, sorry, sorry. You're, t- you're telling me that a modern comedy has come out that doesn't just have reference humor. Yeah, yeah I know. Some, <laughs> some of it is, wow. some of it is, is reference humor. That's because... the, blasphemy, blasphemy. I tell you, <laughs> because there's the, there's a character of Tommy Bahama who shows up, uh, T- Tommy Bahama is the guy who does all those like Hawaiian shirts. Uh, Tommy Bahama is not a real person, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they make it a real person. But there's this bit like 
where there's a small child driving a submarine and he's going like this with the wheel. For those of you at home who are just listening, he's moving his hands in very small movements. And Kristen Wiig plays two roles. She plays also the, the super villain. And over the, the intercom, she's like, yes, perfect. That is how you drive the submarine. Not in one steady motion. Move your hands very quickly from side to side. <laughs> it's just it's really <laughs> silly. Um, but I liked it. I thought it was a pretty good one. Um, one that I thought I was going to really like and then did not was uh, Jim Cummings' sophomore effort, uh, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. Um, which I wanted to watch, but then you told me, then you told me the other day that it wasn't very great. So Jim Cummings is the man who directed Thunder Road, which Liam which and was, I have both seen, and it is very good. Um, it's a pretty impressive one-man show, which is uh, essentially what he set out to make with it. Pretty much, yeah. And it's a so it's a werewolf movie. That's pretty much all you need to know. It's a werewolf movie that takes place in this small little town in uh, like Montana or something like that. And it's called Snow Hollow, duh. Uh, and these people start to get murdered. Jim Cummings plays a cop in this movie too, uh, but th- he's re- a lot more unhinged in Is this. Is he one. still behaving a lot like Jake Morgendorfer from Daria? No, no. Though he does have some weird delivery with his daughter, who's in the movie. That's the thing is it feels like he doesn't know, he didn't know how to write another movie. And so he's like, what if I just take cops and then put them in a werewolf movie? And well, even Thunder Road or when I see projects like that, I always get a little concerned when like it's so much based around like the one person or whatnot that right. there's always a fear that it could become a bit of a one trick pony. And I don't think that's what he's going to be like in his career moving forward. This movie definitely felt like, oh, okay, you could, like, where was the talent here? Like, it's it has really great reviews. People really liked it. I'm not sure who wrote those reviews, you know? Uh, I had one friend who said he enjoyed it. I And I want to ask why, you know? Because not to say, like, my, my opinion is, like, a fucking, ma- like, the end-all be-all by any stretch of the imagination, but, like, the script moves way too fast, The dialogue is really off in some points and just like, whoa, where did that line come from? There was no, there was no lead up to that line. Um, And there, the delivery, sorry, not the delivery. Some of the performances are very, very odd choices because Jim Cummings also directed it, like I said, and he plays a cop in this one, as I said before, but in this one, he's just angry all the time. And in every single scene, he's yelling. And that, that's, that's not a good character. You need to have also, some nuance involved with that. And like show, and they show why he's like that, but it's like, oh, okay, I know why, but it's not, it doesn't help the, his case by any stretch of the imagination because he's just angry. He's just angry well, all the time. Even, um, I know Lucas has talked about like the angry cop trope or whatnot and how he doesn't like it. And the thing I've started to notice recently after we had been discussion about the Lethal Weapon movies is that that's a trope I genuinely don't mind or I kind of like. But I think uh, I've become pretty sour on it because, well, the best way I could say it is Hopper in uh, season three of Stranger Things left a really bad taste in my mouth with that's that fair. whole thing. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fair. Um, okay, so that's Wolf of Snow Hollow. Um, before I get into one thing that Liam and I both watched, I'm going to just talk about a few things that I read. So I started reading uh, comics like a lot more uh, because I realized that I could read comics on my iPad and that I don't need to lug around thousands of pounds of paper everywhere I move. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I, I was like, oh, cool, I can wa- read comics on my, on my computer. Um, uh, so I started reading the Predator comics like from the 90s and going on forward. And if you're a fan of that series, even in the movies and whatnot, I do suggest it because it's a good, it's it's a good world building um, and adds more to the mythos of the predators or the, whatever, what are they called, Liam? How do you pronounce it? I can't pronounce what we're actually called, what our species is called (laughs) for the life of me. I I feel like a bad predator fan. I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I have no idea how to pronounce the name, but uh, they, the comics start out really following the human characters that exist, like as like accessory characters to characters that have already existed in the Predator movies. For example, Dutch, who's Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first Predator, his brother is who you follow throughout the first couple um, books. 
Um, so there's four omnibuses. I'm halfway through the first omnibus, which covers a large chunk of the stories. Um, but yeah, so it follows him predominantly. And then like every once in a while, they kind of like rotate out with new characters that they introduce. Um, but they're very interesting. The comics are really cool. The art is really neat. Um, it's cool to see the predators and be able to not see them move and just like look at their anatomy for a little well, bit of time. Even the way those comics were drawn or whatnot, like, cause I have a couple of, uh, the alien and predator comics and issues. Is that like, uh, this is around like where the color saturation was so all over the place and very like, uh, kind of, I know I use this word a lot, but very pulpy. Mm-hmm that I kind of miss in a lot of comics these days, like where everybody kind of goes for like the over-designed, like hyper detail or just like either that or they go for like the more Fiona staples, like uh, where it's very straightforward and simplified, not to say that it looks bad, but it's very simplified. Well, where this one, it's just like, I wouldn't say over-designed or anything or like the kind of like a million lines all over the place, but right. very poppy. Yeah. And it's easy to follow. Yeah. Visually it's easy to follow. Um, I also started reading uh, a book. Well, I finished uh, this comic series called Demo, written by this guy named Brian Wood, who currently has quite a few allegations against him. So, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his book. Uh, but the book is called Demo, and basically every single issue, so there's 12 issues of the first volume, um, and every single issue is a completely different story. They're not connected to each other, but every single story follows the theme of young people. And I will say out of the 12 that I read, I probably loved four and liked three and didn't like the rest because I was like, uh, eh. just like some of the stories didn't do it for me. And I thought I was like, wait, I don't understand what the hell you were going for. Like, what was the premise of, or what was the purpose of the ending and blah, blah, blah. Um, but there's a couple that are really cool, especially the first handful, which originally it was supposed to follow people with uh, superpowers and like how they're dealing with those. And then it kind of just started talking about human like uh, interaction and like, you know, what it means to be a young person and whatnot, which is interesting. It's an interesting concept, but I was like, yeah, but do more of like the weird superhero shit, <laughs> like more of that, please. Um, but they didn't. So it was, it was what it was. But the last thing I want to talk about is a little book uh, called middle West, uh, which I believe just wrapped up a couple of years ago, and it's a, kind of like a magical world. I believe it's an image comic, and it basically, I've only read the first two issues, but I intend to read more, and it's about this young man uh, who has a very tumultuous relationship with his father. Uh, in the first issue, his at, towards the end of it, he and his father get into an altercation. His father strikes him a few times and becomes incredibly angry and turns into a giant tornado monster. <laughs> yeah it's weird and then they have a an altercation and the young man uh, uh absorbs a portion of that and then he and his little wolf creature who can talk telepathically to him and does not have a name because his his uh as he explains it um the reason why the the fox doesn't have a name is because his mother got too lazy uh which is just hilarious <laughs> but anyway so so our our main character and, and his wolf uh or sorry his fox are trying to discover why and what is happening and trying to find his mother in the per in the process and it's very good the art is phenomenal the art is fantastic and some of the writing is pretty damn good anyway the last thing i wanted to talk about because it's gonna throw it over to liam is i watched uh, Zack Snyder's newest film, Army of the Dead. And that's what I was watching with my buddy Chris last night over on uh, Discord. Yeah. So I'll give you my brief thing. I, it's not a good movie, <laughs> but I liked it. <laughs> so <laughs> Liam, take and, her away. <laughs> so there's one thing I've come to re realize, especially after we did that stretch where we watched all those Zack Snyder movies and I revisited a bunch, which is a lot of them. I don't, a lot of Zack Snyder movies. I do not like very much. However, there are some that I will always have a soft spot for. And there are some aesthetic uh, sensibilities that he does have, that I am kind of a sucker for as juvenile and childish as some of them may be. Um, this movie con continues the trend where the best thing about it is some of the choices Snyder makes, 
but also the worst thing about it is some of the choices he makes. <laughs> 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 like, yep. uh, biggest exactly. positives are, uh, what is it? One, concept alone, a heist is during, during the zombie apocalypse or is fucking awesome. Yeah, it doesn't seem or sound like that would make sense, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> you know, no. Uh, then uh, number two, with a couple of except- exceptions of a few people I didn't really think got a chance to sh- shine, I thought the cast was all great. I thought they had a lo- they were all dripping with personality. I liked how diverse they were. In fact, this kind of this movie also proved what I've been saying about Dave Batista for a while, which is out of all of these act uh, professional wrestlers turned movie stars, he is definitely the most legitimate actor out of all of them. That's He's a, a funny genuinely way of good. Uh-huh. Like no, he definitely ahead. he oh. really carry he really proved with his time that he can carry a movie. Mm-hmm. Like he's definitely it's interesting to say that Batista kind of elevates the material a little bit because he does <laughs> genuinely bring some pathos and uh, true emotion to what he has to do. Yeah, Batista's a genuinely a good actor. I, I don't I wouldn't like go so far as to say he's a great actor, but he's definitely good. He's pretty good. Yeah, and I was the, gonna um, say Liam saying Dave Batista is one of the best to come out. I was like, that's a funny way of saying Dwayne the Rock Johnson. But but here's the thing. Look, well, I was gonna say that like the Rock only only mainly coasts by on like being larger than life and being as charismatic as all fucking hell. Well, Batista knows how to carry being a little bit more quiet and having some dramatic pathos to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't disagree. I while agree. Also being like an absolute physical force. Like there are a couple of really cool scenes where it's just Batista kicking ass. Yeah. <laughs> Tig, Tig Notaro was in that movie, right? K- kind of. Um, so, yeah, so, but, so I'll, let me, can I, I cover a, this? I know, the, I know there's a story behind it. So Chris D'Elia, pedophile crystalia was supposed to be in that film and mm. they shot all of his scenes with him in the movie and then everything came out about him and zach was like yeah out and he's yeah, like but zach we got all this quote, movie still zach said zach snyder said and i quote it was a very easy choice but a very expensive one yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so they put tig in over top of 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 crystalia <laughs> And it's, uh, sometimes, like, sometimes it's pretty goddamn obvious. Mm. I, I, it didn't bug me too much. There were a few points where I could tell that, like, uh, just by the way the shot was framed, that it was probably something new. But it and the wasn't focus enough to too, Liam. Me. Like the the soft, so the most of the movie is soft focus. The movie. Oh God, the Snyder shoots this movie so fucking weird with like soft focus and. Yeah, and I, and I think because he shot most of it like in his fucking backyard, so like they couldn't, they had big green screens and shit, and like couldn't. Mm. couldn't sacrifice certain things so a lot of it is shot really shallow um but yeah there's certain scenes with tig where it's just like she or sorry they are very oh, in focus over top mm-hmm. of shallow focus and oh it's yeah very weird <laughs> yeah you know it wasn't enough to throw me off for the most part i thought it blended in fine but there were a few points where i was like okay i'm starting to notice it yeah um the biggest problem this movie has that carries through all of Zack Snyder's movies is it's too long. I it mean, is. it's two, two and a half, and a half hours. hours long. I'll be nice and say it felt like two hours, but still, but towards the end, I was kind of starting to be like, okay, okay you can speed it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, There's a lot also, of like just uh, melodrama and just like unnecessary melodrama, but then you get cool ass scenes like a zombie riding a zombie horse with a zombie tiger beside him. Oh, honestly, I was joking. That (laughs) the emperor zombie or the Zeus as they call him, he was like the fucking Orakai leader in uh, in uh, Fellowship of a Ring. Yep, like (laughs) kind of remind. He reminded me of that guy. (laughs) Of that guy meets um, Evil Ash from Army of Darkness. Mm Like he looked kind of like Evil Ash, but also kind of like an orc guy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a it's an odd movie because basically what they're just trying to show is that like the zombies just want to be left alone. Like they don't, yeah. they just want to they want to have their area, which is like pretty much all of Las Vegas, Nevada, and they want to have it, and they want nobody to fucking come in. Yeah, no, they literally say like, uh, "You really think they want out of here? This is their kingdom." Yeah, and um, here's the other thing though: is the only thing that's keeping them in slash us out slash us safe is three stack as is, is three shipping containers high wall all the way around and i was like that's not enough i was saying that to uh also another tidbit i had which is so the whole thing is set up that uh uh, that this guy has hired them to go in there because he owns the, this casino where there's a safe underneath there mm-hmm. 
and he says, assemble a team. And he tells them all things that they need. One of them being a safe cracker where I'm like, wait a minute. If it's your safe, why do you need a safe cracker to get in? Why don't you just give them a code? Because um, <laughs> there's no power. Because there's no power. <laughs> I don't know. I was a little co- That threw me off a little bit. The other thing is, uh, I is understand power. this more than in other films like, say, Jurassic World. But like... Uh, Trying to take something uncontrollable and weaponize it, especially in an age where we have drones, which is a plot of this movie, like take something that's uncontrollable and try to weaponize it. I'm like, guys, in a world of drones, this doesn't work. Stop putting this in movies. It's fucking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know, again, I overall, I'll say I enjoyed it. I'd much rather have Zack Snyder do shit like this than... Uh, uh, what is it been uh the dc movies or whatnot because here at least like he's not fucking with a uh with a property that i genuinely care about <laughs> he's mm-hmm. just having fun and um they're making they're actually i think there's gonna there's talks to make another a prequel movie or anime series or something like that right liam yeah they want to uh expand this off into a number of other mediums which it's the same thing they originally planned with something like pacific rim where um, when Del Toro signed on to do Pacific Rim, he wanted to make three movies and then just have it continue as a, uh, if at all, as a Star Wars expanded universe type of a thing. Mm. And uh, I feel like this has enough potential for that, but I'm also like, on the one hand, I'm like, no more cinematic universe for oversaturated. It's why we're sick of Star Wars. It's why we're sick of superhero movies. No more cinematic universes. But on the other hand, if we're going to have cinematic universe, at least this gives us some variety with like animation and uh yeah but i, mean, I don't star, know I star mean... wars is going down that route though like the i mean mm-hmm. the star wars expanded universe is live action and animated and movies yeah i mean like but i mean just like if you're gonna do expanded universes at all just go back to the form of novels or comic books like like don't i don't know i could rant about that shit all day yeah, yeah. but I anyhow like could... i enjoyed it enough um i'm curious i feel I feel like, uh, despite how sick I got of some of the soft focus, Snyder carries himself fine, I'll say, as a DP. Fine is a good, yes. Yeah. Fine is he a had, good He, he uh, does review. it fine. But he does still have some things to learn. Um, But, yeah, no, overall, like, I think what, I, what this really did make me realize in the end is, despite how much I don't like half of his movies... I will always watch a Zack Snyder movie just because I there will always be something that I'll take away from him. There's always, he, it's the same thing I have with Gore Verbinski. Whenever mm-hmm. I, I'll always, even if I don't like a Gore Verbinski movie, there's always at least something that pulls me back or I take away from it. I know I'm kind of in the same boat with Snyder, but I think the only reason is because I feel slightly obligated because we dedicated an, an entire episode and have already seen every single one of his movies. So I feel like if I stop now, that like he'll come find me. Mm. I just, I just think <laughs> I see, he... the, the, it's the sunk cost fallacy. Sunk mm. cost fallacy. Yeah, it's 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 the idea that I've sunk so much into this, I have to keep going. Yeah, and even even if it's uh, it's better to cut your losses. Right, and that's not really what I have. I think it's more so the fact that when we are in a climate where direction and like the way so many movies are made are all starting to look the same and so bland or whatnot. I kind of welcome when something weird and bombastic and crazy comes out, even if it's not very good, just like kind of like that gonzo entertainment, but I'll always kind of have an interest in checking mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, at some point during the week, I think I, I can't remember when exactly Liam texted me and it was just a picture of Patrick Willem's um, letterbox review of army of the dead. Mm-hmm. And it was like, this is what Zack Snyder should be doing making dumb movies that know they're dumb instead of dumb movies that think they're smart or yeah. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, yeah, good way of putting it, Pat. Yeah, it's pretty good. Liam, you got anything mm. else? Uh, after uh, Earlier in the week, I also, uh, just because this was horribly short, I watched uh, the new season of Love, Death, and Robots. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I already gave my biggest thing with it is that they only produced seven episodes this time. Which was, was eight. or, or was sorry, eight episodes, yeah. but it was, which is kind of a letdown. I mean, I get it. it takes a long time to produce, and there's a lot of work that clearly goes into it. Um, but like after two years of waiting for, I kind of wanted them to produce a little bit more. Right. Yeah, because they're some of them are really short, right? Yeah, like most of them are only like six minutes. Yeah, because um, there's one or two that are quite longer, right? But most of them are like seven to eleven minutes. 
I think the longest one is about 17 minutes. Right, right. Did you ever watch the first season, Lucas? No. Oh, okay. okay. It's uh, If you want to see some really creative or fun varieties in animation, I'd say check it out. Um, season two does take one of my biggest criticisms with the first one and kind of start to move away from it finally, which is the uh, over fixation on a su- super graphic violence and uh, and like uh, troubling of uh, undertones towards women. Right. Like they finally started to get away from that, which I appreciated. Um, and there were a couple of shorts that stuck out. Like there's this one in the Arctic, which has a similar animation style to uh, the episode from season one, uh, Zima Blue, mm-hmm. which I thought looked absolutely incredible. There's uh, one that actually really stuck out to me. And for, I haven't heard a lot of people talk very positively about it, but, or at least it doesn't seem to be a standout around all, among most people, which is a, it's a Christmas themed one. Oh. And it's animated in the style. It's animated to look like the Coraline style. Oh, about okay. uh, these uh, little kids who uh, wake up to hear Santa in the night. And uh, I'm not going to go out of my way to fully spoil what it is, but they go down there and what they find is essentially a, de- a monster out of your, a weird alien monster out of your worst nightmares. Oh, God. Okay, cool. I'm not going to uh, spoil I mean, where it's it goes. Probably not receiving a lot of alkaloids because it's a Christmas one and it's summer. <laughs> no, it's fucking May. Um, but overall, I'd say I'd recommend it. Again, like it, it gives me just enough more love, def, love, death, and robots. I just wish it if there was more. Right. Uh, and uh, other just a couple of quick things. I watched uh, the first episode of Invincible. Oh yeah. Uh, the first episode has a strong enough hook. I mean, I'm scared it's gonna have the same, all the same problems that I have with shit like the boys. Um, but I also know Robert Kirkman is a better writer than Garth Ennis, so I have hopes that I'll enjoy it, and especially given he's the showrunner. Right. Because um, Lord knows Walking Dead would not have gone the way it did if he were the showrunner and not, and it weren't just based on what he was writing. Hmm. Speaking of which, I also, uh, since Christian gave me his Walking Dead comics, I've also started to go through those a little bit. Yeah. Um, like, I've never actually watched Walking Dead or read any of the comics, mainly because I wanted to read the comics first before I... Uh, touch the show at all but now at this point i think i'm like i think i'll just read the comics and leave the show alone yeah you, they're it's probably a good idea it's probably the best best choice i probably. watched i watched that show for like four seasons after i stopped liking it cost sink analysis <laughs> <laughs> sunk cost fallacy there. <laughs> cost sink. my sink costs how much no, no the biggest thing that um uh what is it that i've had with uh something like invincible is as i've said before it's not really that I'm over just the idea of superheroes per se. I'm just sick of the whole way we fr- we constantly frame the idea, whether it be in uh, postmodernism or in just straight up adaption. I'm just real. That's what I'm really tired of. Yeah. Like I'm not the kind of person who gets tired of genres. I'm the kind of person who gets really tired of just because like genre has so much capability as a whole. I just get so sick of everybody trying to do the same thing with any genre. It's kind of like how I got sick. Uh, was it in the uh, 2000s? I got really sick of epic fantasy after um, everything was Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Yeah. I don't know. Just something I was thinking. That was just something I was thinking about recently with uh, watching Invincible and why I wasn't super quick to go back to watching the next couple of episodes. Yeah. What's what? We, what's bothered me? I mean, we've talked about this before, but like the the concept of bad guy superheroes, it just drives me mm. bananas. Like I think Watchmen did it best. And like there, there are other other books that have attempted to do those things. And like, what if what if a superhero showed off as a good guy, but was actually a bad guy? Or even just like uh, superheroes are great because they're deterrence for aliens or nine eleven style threats. Right. Mm. Which is uh, I talked about that with Falcon and the Winter Soldier, where it's like I'm really sick of. Right. And I find just troubling for reasons I'm not really going to get into because I could write a paper on that. <laughs> um, but then, lastly, here's going to be a big one. Wait, do you want to just do you want to just wait until we do the show itself? Let's wait until we what? do the actual show. Okay, wait, okay. wait. Sorry, <laughs> segment sorry. two of the show. Yeah, what? when we get into the meat of the episode and our main topic, uh, uh, you know, just yeah, I'm. I've built up enough anticipation. There we go. Uh, recommendations, go. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Was our ingestion <laughs> for this week? What are our recommendations, everyone? What are your recommendations for this week, Lucas? Um, sure. Uh, 
I feel like I can't not recommend the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I know it's kind of, it feels kind of weird to like recommend something I already talked about the ingestion, but I'm but I'm going to. I'm gonna do um, the same thing. That's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, it's great. It's good. Yeah. They're fun games, and it, if you haven't played it before, I highly recommend going in as blind as you can. Uh, don't do a perfect playthrough, and by that I mean like. Mass Effect is a game where you're during over the course of three games, your choices genuinely do have consequences. Like there, there are points in all three games where you can lose squad members, right? Like and people, permanently, like these, right? Permanently, yes. Like characters that you grew, grow to love, you can genuinely die and never be seen again. Um, like especially in especially in the third one, the 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 ending kind of doesn't really take your choices into account but like all the missions leading up to it do and like choices from the first game can affect things that happen in the third game uh so i personally know exactly i, I played these games so many times i know exactly what to do to uh uh get the exact situations that i want to happen to happen right i recommend you first play through don't do that don't look up guides on like on how to get like the the perfect playthrough or, or anything like that just go in as blind as you can make the choices you think your character would and see what happens fantastic uh my recommendation for this oh, week... oh, oh, uh, oh. also it, it it is on ps4 and xbox one oh <laughs> Yeah, coming full circle on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my recommendation for this week is uh, the Predator comics. If you can get your hands on those there omnibuses, that'd be fantastic. Marvel recently just bought uh, because they bought Fox, right? So now they own the rights to um, Alien. Well, Marvel didn't. Disney. Did. Sorry, Disney did. Is what I meant. But Marvel produ- will be producing yes. the comics moving just, forward. We just gotta make sure we address the evil monolith in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Previously, they were being written. Or sorry, produced by. Uh, Dark Horse, uh, which is the omnibuses that I'm reading. Um, but in the next year, Marvel will be putting out uh, the omnibuses uh, as their own book. But instead of there being four volumes, there's just going to be two. Uh, very thick, huge. If you've ever seen the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hardcover books, they're going to be about that size. So they're very large. I don't see the fucking point in that, but that's just me. Uh, it's a little excessive. It's overkill. It's fucking overkill. But the ones that I'm reading, if you can find, get your hands on the smaller Dark Horse omnibuses, I highly recommend them. Liam, what do you got for us today? Um, I am going to recommend a remastered game as well. Hmm. Like, I'm not really going to talk about I recommend. I said I, wa- I started doing it last week in the ingest or last time in the ingestion. But I didn't really get into detail. I'm not going to get into a lot, whole lot of detail here because it's not really something to describe of a Jack and Daxter collection or remastered oh, okay. for the, um, I was at for on the PlayStation Store. They never made a physical version. They only released it on the PlayStation Store, which is something I usually uh, really hate doing because I like to uh, buy physical copies of things. Yeah. Not because I like to have like a huge extensive collection, but it's more so because... Uh, if I don't like it, I could sell it and get my money back. Yeah, yeah. Or recoup sure. some of my losses. Yeah. Um, but I've been playing that recently, and yeah, they're fun. They're great. They're so they're, much fun. Uh, yeah. Really childish, kind of like Crash Bandicoot, but yeah, uh, it's the kind of childish stuff that I really like. Uh, just wait till you get to Jack Three. They're not really childish <laughs> at that point. They, well, even they... Jack Two, like uh, when Dark Jack at it, when he gets turned to Dark Jack. Yeah, it's, it's fucking um, ridiculous, but. And even the last one in their uh, combat racing or whatnot, I'm not usually one for racing games, but I like this one. Yeah, okay. I like driving around and blowing up other drivers. Combat racing is the closest you could get to a sequel to pod racing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which I Honestly, do have... the pod racer game is a great game. Like, I actually have N64? it for my N64. <laughs> nice. I think it's, I do too. It's fucked up Somewhere. fun. Yeah, I have it no, on my it... Switch. Nice. Yeah, no, I will say, uh, despite the remaster, it does still have a problem I've seen with a lot of remasters where some of the controls are absolute bunk. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm yeah. just like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah, they haven't like, grown you up can, very well. You can readapt so much, but you can't make it so that this control can also do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah there are points enough. where it just drives me crazy where I'm like, like, because there's the, uh, fuck, I'm going to sound like such a noob, but... Uh, what is on the PS4 controller when there's the, uh, I uh, was it the plus, uh, was it on the left hand side where there's like the little die, the four dials? Uh, you need to use those. Oh, the, to... the D pad? 
Yeah, you need to use those to the, uh, the D pad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they the, they had those on the PlayStation controller. No, it drives me crazy. The fact that I'm like, why do you only need to program it to that when you also when you also have the other controls that do essentially the same function, like the analog stick. Yeah, like why not just make it so the analog stick can also do it instead of having to jump between the two? Every other game does. Uh, was you it might, has that? You might be well, because are we going to get into this right now? Because some games require literally every single button on your controller. Right. This one is one of those things where they just they have buttons for arbitrary functions, and it kind of annoys me. You might be able to remap things. Yeah. That's what that's, I'm trying yeah, to that's, do. That's that's what I personally love about uh, uh, keyboard and mouse is if I don't like something, I go into the menu, go into keybinds, and change everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that yeah. is one advantage. I just don't like the format of playing something on my computer. Yeah. Hmm. Like when Lucas and I were playing Ark, uh, he'd tell me a button and I'd press it and it wouldn't do what I wanted it to. And he's like, oh yeah, right. That's just for me. <laughs> yeah, I remapped it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that has been the ingestion and the recommendations for this week. A quite in a long you, ingestion, actually, in, this time. In, in case you couldn't tell, I couldn't think of something to recommend. <laughs> That's all right. That's a very classic Liam move on the Thundercast. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about good directors gone bad. And we have quite a few. Uh, next. And why? And Why does that happen? Potentially why. Anyway, we are going to go for a break, and we'll catch you at the end of that. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Thundercast. My name is Christian. My name is Lucas. And I'm Liam. Here with another movie. Sorry, can we start over? <laughs> you know the Here movie that talks about podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Thundercast. Today, we are going to be talking about good directors that have gone bad. As you can mm -hmm. see, I've flipped my screen, so now everything's not weird. Maybe I'll flip it back. Who the fuck knows? This is chaos over here, everybody. We're <laughs> fucking chaos podcast. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about um, directors who started off their career um, very strongly, or even maybe did the inverse, but uh, started out very strongly and maybe made a couple of mistakes along the way. Uh, and and... Just, like, why this tends to happen? Because it, it, it's something that... With as long as film's been around, just it always happens. Like, with at least somebody, no matter how many years pass. Yeah, I have my thoughts as to why, but we'll get into uh, all of that in a little bit. That's right. And because we won't, we don't want to break your balls any longer. Liam, what was the movie that you wanted to bring up at the end of your ingestion that we feel as though is a good segue? So, this is a movie that I had been putting off for almost ten years. Mm -hmm. It is a movie made by the director, Richard Kelly, who did my favorite movie of all time. And the reason I would I would, had been putting it off for so long is because this movie was essentially some... Had to, I was being the 15-year-old that I was, I was scared. I was like, would this make, watching this make me not like my favorite movie anymore? Um, it's a movie that's famous for having one of the most disastrous screenings that has ever happened at the Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And that is Richard Kelly's sophomore effort, Southland Tales. Southland starring, Tales. Starring The Rock, Sean William Scott, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Justin Timberlake, Mandy Moore, Wallace Shawn, and too many other people to count. Amy Poehler. Uh, that's it, really. That's all the ones that are of note. Okay. So Donnie Darko, I know Lucas, you're not you're not a huge fan of that movie, right? You've seen Donnie Darko. I liked right? it. Right, right. Um, oh, yeah. I, I was, for some reason I always thought you didn't like it. Okay, but beside the point. So yeah, Donnie Darko oh. <laughs> is uh, Richard Kelly's first film, uh, first feature film, I should say, and it is um, considered to be one of the better films of the 21st century. Well, it's um, one of the most successful. Uh, cult or indie films that's come out in the past 30, uh, 20 years or so that's right um and it deals with some pretty uh, out there concepts you know time travel fut futility of life like but it's also very grounded and very human right with a lot of uh, just very close to home uh commentary about suburban life yeah Richard Kelly was like, what if I did literally the exact opposite of that <laughs> I take these big <laughs> concepts and I make possibly the most ambitious fucking movie that's ever been made. Yeah. That's like that 
definitely has some like needless complexity to it. Um, it so okay. First and foremost, the movie's two and a half hours long. There's no reason for it to be that goddamn. The long. original cut was 15 minutes longer when it premiered at Cannes. Yeah, and I want to know what those 15 minutes that got cut out were. Um, but the basic premise is the Rock, who plays a character named Boxer Santoris, who's a uh, action movie star with amnesia, but with political ties. Yeah. Um, who, who has apparently written a screenplay that prophesizes the end of the world with his girlfriend slash mistress, who is a porn star named what's her name? Crystal Krista now. now. Krista who is uh, now. trying to get a new lifestyle brand out, and their paths cross with um a uh a, was it with a uh, cop who's missing his brother, uh named uh, Ronald uh, Tavinger mm-hmm. or Tavener. Yep, Ronald Tavinger and his brother Roland. Tavinger. Um, so here's the one thing that I did want to bring up when well, Lucas and I were, or sorry, Liam and I were watching this movie. None of these are real people names. Um, <laughs> Boxer Santoris is not a fucking name. I, I don't care. Uh, it's ridiculous. And, it, and the whole time Liam and I were watching it, I was like, that's not a fucking name. That's not a name. Um, also, to give some background about this movie, again, I don't want to just spend the whole time. Uh, talking about this one movie yep. because uh welcome to liam and christian southland tales podcast. <laughs> um, though if you guys do want to hear us talk about this for a while let us know and we'll see what we could figure out yeah, we, we got a couple um, of things in the works. but to give some background uh essentially r- this movie was written right after uh 9 11 um and uh essentially the whole setup is that uh essentially there was a terror attack that uh leveled texas it caused uh, the Patriot Act to expand and the Republican Party to gain a, oh, a, was it so much surveillance to a point where there's a sniper in a tower on every corner of the street. Mm. And this is also leading to uh, the neo, a new neo-Marxist movement that's Sorry. trying to uh, overthrow the Republican Party. I'm, I'm just imagining the Republicans being like, we're going to create so many jobs for snipers, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everything in this movie is told through... Uh, uh, gospels and uh, platitudes narrated by uh, Justin Timberlake, who plays a war veteran. Yeah. Who also <laughs> at one point has a scene in the middle of a film where he just breaks out and does a mouthing dancing routine to uh, all these things that I've done by the killers. Yep. It's literally the center of the film. And as Richard Kelly has put it, it's the heart of the movie. And it's, it's absurd. Because nope. the whole time he's just drinking. Liam, can you hold up your can for a moment? He's I've holding up one soul, of these. But I'm not a soldier. <laughs> and he's fucking pouring Budweiser in his head while there's can can dancers everywhere and he's in an arcade and it's absurd. Anyway, but what what's so disappointing about this is that Richard Kelly proved himself to be well, not proved, but demonstrated what his skill set was with Donnie Darko. In and that, like just how much promise he had and what could happen. Exactly. Like Donnie Darko also wasn't a big hit when it came out. Uh, was it but it gained a huge following on dvd and his uh next effort got hyped up considerably yeah and when you have all that star power behind the movie a lot of people who were kind of nobodies at the time but also a lot of star power inside of that film um and you're saying oh i'm gonna make this epic you know epic um neo he essentially wanted to make a as he described it a philip k dick novel Meets like Andy Warhol style pop art. Yeah, it's very weird. I can see Lucas's face. It may face sound, like, it, may sound <laughs> it may sound brilliant and hella ambitious and certainly I mean, ambitious. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, no, it's like it's. I mean, without fear of with fear of too talking about it, this movie this movie itself too long. It's it is an absolute narrative failure. It's one of the most disjointed and all out of a all over the place uh, messes of a movie I've ever seen. But it's also one of the most creative and ambitious I've ever seen. Yeah. Probably the most. So it is. I kind of loved it for that. It is equally one of the worst movies I've ever seen and one of the best movies I have ever seen because mm-hmm. there is so much ridiculous shit. Like, there is a great scene where at the end of the film, with the greatest line ever written, which is. Even though it's hella problematic. It's incredibly problematic. But The Rock looks pretty much directly into the camera, raises the one eyebrow and says, I'm a pimp and pimps do not commit suicide. (laughs) 
It is but, fucked up. It is so but, stupid. And then also, up. also, beside the, also, just I just want to mention one thing. There's a scene where one car literally fucks another car. Um, like he, the the car grows a dick from its exhaust pipe and fucks another it's car. It's a commercial for. It's a, commercial. It's a fake commercial in the movie, kind of UHF oh, okay. style. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I laughed for about ten minutes. I mean, <laughs> but I was gonna say, just as a the reason why we talk about this as a, a way to set this up is to just really break down how this is kind of a perfect showcase on at least what I think tends to happen with a lot of filmmakers. Yeah or at least like uh, why filmmakers go bad. Mm. And I want to hear your, uh, what is it, your retort, or if you have one to this, Lucas, which is that I think the problem is that somebody comes out, makes something really special, and we immediately let, what was it, brand them as the new game changers, the new great auteurs. And it immediately goes to their heads and think they could do fucking anything until it destroys them. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you continue to live up to this anymore? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think that definitely plays a part. There's a lot of pressure to put on somebody, um, and and even if it doesn't like necessarily go to their head, they're like they're gonna have it in their head where they're like, okay, well, I made a good movie. Uh, I have to make another another good one now. I I, I don't know. I I'll try. I'll do my best, and then it flops, and they're like, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. Like like who are some uh like let's try to think of some really good examples of uh people who we thought were gonna be like the new game changers that kind of quickly went down. mm Hmm. I think an um, obvious choice is M Night. Mm. I think M Night is an obvious choice for. I think for... Uh, honestly, the Wachowskis are a pretty good example. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. they had a uh, Bound, which was a pretty solid indie film, and then The Matrix, which became a cultural icon, and mm-hmm. then uh, uh, what is it? Lily and Lena just didn't know how to live up to it, at, live up to themselves after that. Yeah, and like uh, to 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 use a, a bit of a D and D metaphor. Uh, they might not actually be great film filmmakers, but they rolled a nat twenty on in that movie. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, for 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 a more modern example of someone who like exploded onto the scene and then didn't really go anywhere, Josh Trank. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he he. Uh, after obviously he just kind of faded from existence after uh, Fantastic, but like um, like he he if i i, I want to make sure i'm correct on this he made chronicle right yep. he directed chronicle yep. yeah yep. and he made yeah. a movie that came out last year which uh mm. uh people either really liked or they didn't which one yeah uh capone with tom oh, hardy right. mm. didn't see it but like uh <laughs> but yeah i think i think uh the the arrogance is definitely a part like liam said yeah the pressure i think is a part of it and i think sometimes people just have one good story in them yeah that's a good point yeah. yeah and i think also uh hollywood and like the film industry in general is set up for a specific type of person to thr- to thrive yeah. like you, you have to be totally cool with working long hours you have to be really passionate and like the the film industry uh in my opinion is pretty toxic at least yeah in, like, uh, well even just from an audience perspective there's a part of me that thinks it's not even just on like hollywood or whatnot but it's on us as fans or consumers for like mm-hmm. holding these people to such high regard or whatnot like to be honest we talked about this a couple of episodes back but i think that's led to a lot of what enabled joss whedon and him being yeah. like an icon in the uh, nerd scene and whatnot mm-hmm. for sure people putting people up on pedestals and uh parasocial relationships and all that crap but like uh yeah, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. What are what are some more uh, examples of uh, good directors gone bad? I can well, think of a couple. An obvious one. one being George Lucas. Yes, or yeah. even uh, Lucas's best George Lucas, one of his best friends, Francis Ford Coppola. He may yeah. have made the big game changers, but uh, with Apocalypse Now and the original two Godfathers. But he also made Jack. <laughs> he, uh, he also made Jack. He also made um. What's uh, the the adaptation of The Outsiders that a lot of people don't like? I like The Outsiders. I, uh, a lot yeah, of people I, I, really don't like the version that went to theater. I, I know he has a director's version. Yeah, I like the book a lot. Uh, I remember seeing the movie in school, and I just remember it like being filmed really weird. Like, there's a lot of scenes where like people's heads are cut off, mm. and I don't mean that like their heads are like literally cut <laughs> off; just they're they're cut off by the top of the frame. Yeah. Um, and like it, it was just filmed really weird. But go on, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, like sorry, just going back on on the Lucas thing, uh, like for George Lucas specifically. Is that like you? I think for him specifically, is that it's the one good story thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, he, well, I mean, he did have American Graffiti before that, which I've never seen, but I know it's pretty well regarded. And a lot of people think that 
some people almost think think dream of an alternate reality where he didn't make star wars and just kept making movies like that Mm -hmm. i would actually uh i i know i know i brought him up but i'm gonna kind of backpedal on that a little bit I don't think George Lucas was ever a good director, um, and I don't mean that to I don't I don't mean that to insult the guy. Uh, Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie, is very famous for being saved in the edit. Right, like like it, just... it was it was a disaster. The first screening of it, people fucking hated it, and then the uh, then the they they brought in or the, I don't know if they brought in the editors or there's editors just started working on it again. I don't know exactly what happened, but like the editors took all the footage and found a good movie in it. Even um, well, even with Star Wars, there was also the fact that um, he was still kind of well, just a kid, and mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. and even during the filming, was understood that filmmaking was very much a collaborative medium, and he yeah. did have to receive pointers from so many other people. Yeah, and he's also been vocal about how he doesn't he 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 hated directing the first Star Wars movie. Like he he, there's a reason he didn't direct Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. It's because he didn't want to direct them. He didn't enjoy the process. George Lucas is great at coming up with ideas and building worlds and like outlining stories. Uh, but that's kind of, that is his like specialty. Yeah. He's Where ideas, com- man. Yeah. I yeah. Even... And, and like outlining and stuff like that. Like the, the, the outline of the prequel trilogy is genuinely like the general idea is, is extremely compelling. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting. It's even like, it's just settled... in the specifics that he kind of, uh, that's kind of one of his weaknesses. Yeah. Or it's even like uh, what we, like I made a joke about it in the Snyder episode we did, but I see a lot of things with him. I see a lot of parallels between him and George Lucas, where there's a lot of really good ideas mm-hmm. and a lot of things going on, but like, you're not the person to be telling these stories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. It's funny because Kasdan is actually, Lawrence Kasdan is actually on this list. Uh, I, I looked up a, a list just to see like if who we were going to talk about were, and so far, yes, we've hit them all in the fucking head. <laughs> well, I mean, Kasdan, <laughs> I've always said, he's a really good writer. He's not a very good director. Mm. Mm-hmm. yeah that's fair um yeah like going going into kind of how we were talking about in terms of people who maybe uh started really strong and then it got to their head um mm-hmm. i can think of like who i mentioned earlier with with m night because i feel like m night there are a number of things where he was like you know he had a great run the Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, Signs, like, is is it that order? Is that right? Yeah, uh, the, un, uh, the six, he did a movie before that, um, which uh, I the title of it escapes me, but it was a very small underground film. Right. Mm. Um, um, but then do people consider Signs to be a good movie. Yes. Us. Uh, yeah. I mean, oh, there's, okay. there are a lot of things I like about Signs. Honestly, I've I I I tried. Like, I remember I watched it or tried to watch it at least like probably close to 10 years ago now and i fucking hated it <laughs> he wrote um, a movie called wide awake liam yeah wide awake mm. is uh one that uh kind of has a bit of an underground following right um, um i think what happened with Shyamalan is that he sparked he just sparked too early yeah um like george lucas you could at least argue that he did have two good movies under his belt before that then mm-hmm. he just got really lazy in the director's chair yeah i mean i need how- to actually get around to watching thx and american graffiti i really want to watch thx like, mm-hmm. like I want to see. I've never seen American Graffiti either. I feel like they might be good for mm-hmm. like to reignite my belief in him as a human being, um, and not just a mongrel of money, you know. But <laughs> even uh, well, American Graffiti is actually one of my dad's favorite movies. Oh, really? Nice. Like, I mean, how Shyamalan? How can you bounce back from Stuart Little? Really? Like, let's let's face it. Like, there's no way you can go anywhere but but downhill from there. I mean, Shyamalan frankly. is an interesting thing, also in like. Not only has a good director gone back who went who lost his way, but he's also kind of one who came back for a little bit, mm, which is true. another thing to some like some people who like because there are a number of filmmakers who they uh do they we they kind of go off, but then they kind of come back around eventually. But mm. it looks like M. Night's back on the downturn because we had we had the visit and split, and I like both of those films, but then we had Glass, and then we have and, his new one coming out called Old that looks really bad well glass is a movie for me where it's third act destroyed it mm. yeah that's hard mm. yeah that's fair yeah i um, guess i don't I, I guess i can't really say too much about Shyamalan because i've only seen his bad movies um yeah. i haven't seen six cents or at least like i haven't seen all of it all the way through right. uh, i haven't seen unbreakable i haven't seen signs in a long time but i remember not liking it 
I, I saw After Earth and I saw The Last Airbender. <laughs> and they're, those I think those are probably two of his worst movies. You haven't seen The Village uh, or Lady in the Water, which are both equally as bad? <laughs> or what about... <laughs> uh, here's uh, an interesting one that uh, was brought to my attention just because of Christian's background. What about Robert Zemeckis? It's funny. I wanted to bring up Zemeckis. Hmm. Yeah. Zemeckis has lost his way for a while now. Yeah, like... Zemeckis had sorry let me just uh, look up his Wikipedia so we're not did Zemeckis direct the animated Tintin movie or was uh, that no Spielberg? that was Spielberg yeah because oh, that was Spielberg okay no um, but like yeah with with the thing with Spiel with uh, Zemeckis though Liam is like Zemeckis did not start off strong like used cars and I want to hold your hands hand did not get very far especially used I, cars used cars like. Was, was a fucking flop. Well, I know uh, I want to hold your hand, at least uh, on a critical level, is starting to get a, has gotten a resurgence. And right. people say like, uh, there's actually an excellent video by Patrick Willems on it where he talks about mm-hmm. where Robert Zemeckis lost his way because his movies were always great because it was about one person instead of just pop, or was it with one set goal and just trying to get it all done. Right. And do what he needs to do. And then, but then his focus became more so on like the different things he could do behind the camera and the different filmmaking techniques yeah, he could like, play with. Which is what Cameron did too, right? Like, ooh, I mm-hmm. get all these fun, fancy toys. How can I use these fancy toys? Ooh, toys, 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 toys. And then instead of, okay, how do I tell a, a compelling and interesting story? Because in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. he's not always the writer. That's something we do have to put into, put into perspective is that like the man's only written, like he wrote Back to the Future, um, but he didn't write Back to the Future 2 and 3. He, he has a story credit, but he didn't write those movies. And then, like, he wrote Polar Express, A Christmas Carol, The Walk, M- Welcome to Morrowind, Witches, and Pinocchio. And, like, the new it's Pinocchio. A lot of movies. Which is, it, yes, but the man's the man has directed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 22, 23 movies. Well, Jesus, how old is he? Three that are upcoming to be. Announced. He's in his seventies. Mm. So twenty. Oh, okay. The man's directed twenty sense. films, and he's seventy years old. So mm-hmm. like, you know, the, the guy's hit or miss. But the thing is, is most often miss. Like when you think about the good Zemeckis films, it's like Back to the Future, Romancing the Stone, Contact, uh, Polar Express. Cast a lot away. Of I don't. I, I don't think. I don't think most people consider Polar Express a good movie. Really? Um, people yeah. say it's a. A lot of people say it's a. a was it? It's a movie that's good despite. A, was it in spite of its ugly animation style? Mm. Yeah. See, okay. I. Did, I guess I just remember it fondly. Okay. Okay. I. Um, my, my. My. My family watched it every Christmas, so maybe that's. Uh, tainting it for me. That's fair. Um, <laughs> even even with... Castaway is con- is not considered like highly acclaimed, but I like mm. Castaway. Oh no, Castaway is still uh, pretty well regarded in a lot of film circles. Yeah, at least in what it was able to accomplish. Um, one thing I was gonna say, but I think guys like Zemeckis have in common with uh, Spielberg or even Martin Scorsese, is that they've been making movies for so long, and they're getting so old that sometimes, like even Martin Scorsese wrote. The 2000s kind of started to, uh, he didn't make movies that people necessarily didn't like. They just weren't hitting home for anybody. Like, right. mm. who really talks about gangs of New York anymore? Mm. Like, with the exception of Depart- The Departed, I struggle to think of what really stands out in the 2000s that he made. Yeah. Uh, and then, well, The Aviator, The Departed. Mm. Yeah. Like, those are the he only made, two he I made, really... He made Hugo, right? Yeah. Yeah, but Hugo came next decade. It's oh, 2011. Okay. Liam, he had, I don't know, like, from, because he had Gangs of New York... The Aviator, The Departed. That was 2002, 2004, 2006. Those are all but pretty, think, pretty highly regarded films. Yeah, but think about it. The Departed is one that people still talk about reference and show acclaim for. People don't really have that the same way with The Aviator or, um, oh, what is it? Or, uh, what's the, or Gangs of New York. Yeah. Gangs of, mm-hmm. Gangs of New, York, New York, especially, is one I didn't care for very much. I hate yeah, that, The Wolf of Wall Street. I know a lot of people love mm-hmm. that movie, but I don't like it. I, it's not. It's not very good. It's not good. I, like I don't. I don't get why why people love that movie so much. Liam and I just not, sipped at the not, same time. That freaked me the fuck out. So if you're watching this at home, <laughs> take a sip. Like um, Wolf of Wall Street isn't even very well filmed. No. Like, I don't like. I don't, I don't really. I don't really get it. Like, it's. I mean, what's impressive is that you can't tell what's CG and what's not CG in that movie. But even then, yeah. like, is that is that like a is that no? Is it a good movie? <laughs> like, um, no. Well, there 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 are so many times when I'll, it's been a while since I watched it. To be fair, but like when I did watch it, I was like, oh look, green screens. 
Oh, look, more green screens. Oh, right. it's green screens again. Right. I, like it was. It to, to me at least, it, st- it stood out like, kind of like a sore mm-hmm. thumb. No, I was gonna say that. Like, uh, I feel like actually maybe uh, uh, Scorsese and um, Spielberg both also fell into the whole Zemeckis toys things or whatnot, or with the turn mm-hmm. of the millennium, what they could really do or. I don't, get away so with with Spielberg. I don't think so much oh, with Spielberg. I don't think so much I don't know. I mean, I think of like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Kingdom of a Crystal Skull, uh, Tin Tin. Like mm-hmm. Spielberg made a long stretch of movies that weren't very great for a while. It took him a while. I think it was Lincoln. It wasn't until Lincoln where he really recaptured what people remembered mm-hmm. as a great Spielberg film. I thought people yeah. loved Tin Tin. I enjoyed um, Tin Tin personally. It's an, impressive vi- it's an impressive visual achievement, but it's also... A little over, I think it's a little over baked personally. Hmm, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Spielberg had to go back to uh, simple. Not that Lincoln's a simple story; it's 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 a complicated story, but like not an action movie, <laughs> right? Yeah, go back to your roots a little bit more. It's yeah. kind of like what uh, I know uh, you don't like this movie, Lucas, but it's I think what George Miller realized after like a long stretch of making like mm. Happy Feet or whatnot is or like uh visual experiments like that or a number of projects that got off didn't get off the ground it's time he was like okay i think it's time to get back to basics <laughs> it's time to go mm. drive cars in the fucking desert yeah <laughs> um I, drive to one place and drive back that's, i even had the same the thing with uh i was it in this is uh might turn into a segue into the oddballs of uh a very distinct filmmakers but like it's kind of what i had with tim burton for a long time i had him i fucking opened up the I, page. He, he, he was he was someone on my list as well like, yeah i remember uh for a long stretch i did not like a, a tim burton movie at all i did not like uh charlie and the chocolate factory i did not like um uh what's it called dark shadows i didn't like alice in wonderland mm. there are but this, he made this, a, might have been, this might have been a little before that but his version of the planet of the apes is awful oh, it's one of the worst movies but, ever made but then yeah, he made it's, it's uh, the worst Planet of the Apes movie, and there's some like some of the ones in the original uh, five are pretty bad. Yeah. Then then I remember he made uh, I was it he did a feature length to one of his old films, Frank and Weenie, a little back to basics, mm-hmm. and I actually liked it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Frank and Weenie. There there are very few Tim Burton films that I actually really like. Like I like Beetle. I like Be- Pee Wee's Big Adventure because I think it's just a fucking hoot. Um, Beetlejuice, I like Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, yeah. um, Ed Wood, uh, and Mars Attacks are probably the ones that I like the most. I never saw Frank and Weenie, so I can't be much of a judge. But I don't even really like Big Fish that much, you know. I like, like Big Fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Liam, do you, do, you, do you like fish sticks? <laughs> just, just what you said. That Liam was so I funny. like Big Fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a ringtone at some point. Oh yeah, <laughs> I like Big Fish. <laughs> I actually kind of sounded like Tim Bear. There you go, perfect. Yeah, I think I think uh, Tim Burton's like height, like at his height, was probably like Beetlejuice, it's like five two. Beetlejuice, <laughs> probably. I think his big uh, his big claim to success were um, around the same time he had. Batman, Edward Scissorhands, and Beetlejuice. Mm-hmm. Like those are the big ones that really established him. 88, 89, and ninety. Yeah. Yeah, and and and, and obviously uh, this uh, and in ninety three is uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, which is uh, a really big one as well. Oh, that's yeah. also not a Tim Burton movie. Yeah, he, <laughs> he just produced that. It's called Tim Burton stuff, <laughs> which that pisses me off. Yeah, it's wrong on so many levels. <laughs> which. Uh, no, I promised myself I would not get into a rant about auteur theory. I promised myself I would not get into a rant about auteur theory. Um, but I mean, even look at guys like, uh, uh, was it one of my favorite uh, yo-yoing directors, as I'll call him, Robert Rodriguez, goes mm. from making either risk of really awesome, likable movies to some of the most, the only people who could enjoy this are 12-year-olds. And, but <laughs> or also, at the, same, the thing with Rodriguez that's different with like, because like Tim Burton was like, oh, I'm going to make kids' movies, but I'm going to make kids' movies that I would want to see. Rodriguez makes movies, kids' movies where he's like, I think my kids will really like this. I think my, my children will actively enjoy these films. And then kind of kept doing it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like a little mm. beyond he should have, but that's because the man likes money and making pizzas <laughs> in his massive, massive, massive house. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, it's more so that... Hey, Lucas, remember when we went to school with a guy who got to go make pizzas with Robert Rodriguez? Yep. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went. Little known fact, to... that same guy that we went to school with now has three kids. Really? And he's younger than you. Yeah. Well, good for him, I guess. I, uh, good for you, I guess. <laughs> no, like, 
I guess the thing, I mean, like, I guess it's one of those things where it's kind of hard not to admire a guy who just had kids and wanted to make movies with them. Yeah. But it is also one of those things where it's like, those are home movies, guys. Just keep them to yourself. Like, I guess. And I think another one, another one kind of fits in, like, as you, as you put it, the yo-yoing category is probably Ridley Scott. Yeah. Oh, oh Ridley he's Scott a big goes. Yeah. Rid Ridley Scott go. Ridley Scott goes from like lampooning his own style to winning everybody <laughs> back over again by by reclaim again. Yeah, yeah, basically. And also, I just I just opened Ridley Scott's IMDb page, and apparently they announced a Gladiator two. Yeah, that's been that? thrown around for no, years. There's I, been a I script didn't... that was turned in by Nick Cave. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the singer where apparently where it involved uh, Maximus uh, going to the spirit world and then just having to fight through all the world's wars <laughs> to get back to his wife and kids. Yeah. Someone said they should make them. So someone, uh, like in the comments, said like, "Oh, is it going to be about Maximus's descendants?" <laughs> I'm like, they killed his only son. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was <laughs> like, gonna say big plot point of the movie. I forgot I Ridley Scott we're... directed Thelma and Louise. Yeah. Um, actually, that's one thing I was gonna say about uh Ridley Scott. Um, so I was it when I talk about guys like who I say the oddballs, like uh Tim Burton, uh. Uh, was it Robert Rodriguez or Barry Sonnenfeld? Um, like uh, the biggest thing that I think also uh, hurts them as much as it is a thing for them is that if you will go turn on a movie and you didn't know it was made by them, the first few frames, you know it's made by them. Mm -hmm. And like uh, they have very distinct voices and styles. Right. Ridley, like, and they have a very consistent oeuvre. Ridley Scott doesn't really have a, doesn't really have one. Not really. He'll make an, a historical mm -hmm. epic. He'll make something like Thelma and Louise. He'll make a weird fantasy thing like Legend. He'll do mm -hmm. sci-fi noir like Blade Runner. Yeah. Like he just does fucking everything. Then he does like like very uh then he does something like The Martian, which is technically sci-fi, but like very, very grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even Spectre like mob films like American Gangster. Mm -hmm. People forgot he made that or all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he's 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 got such an eclectic uh uh, filmography <laughs> and I think that might be a bit of his detriment like Ridley Scott seems to just want to try and try everything at least once mm. which you and know sometimes it just... is, that's impressive and I and I appreciate Honestly, the tenacity is. yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay um, before because I feel like we're maybe running out of steam on we're just I feel like we're just naming directors or but, I mean know. like I think it's important if we, one comes up like we could just say like uh, where, what we think is I think the thing with like good directors going bad is the spectrum is so wide on like why things happen. Mm -hmm. I personally think the I was of a biggest issue is a is a claiming and hailing people as like these new our new great filmmakers and like these true auteurs who can never do anything bad. Like to be honest, that's where I think Christopher Nolan is starting to fall into mm -hmm. these days. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. I, I would not be surprised if in like within the, within Nolan's next two movies, he has one that like flops really hard. <laughs> I mean, Both, like critically and financially. Oh, okay, because I was gonna say Tenet kind of flopped technically, but that's because mm -hmm. Nolan films never make the money back because mm -hmm. they're. Oh no, they always make the money back. Eh, but he yeah, released but, like, this during I think a. Campaign. Our definitions of making their money back are very different because it's yeah, still technically a flop. Uh, yeah. Nolan, I don't think Nolan's uh, made a movie that's a pretty flop. Sure all of per his se. movies are technically flops. Like uh, the dark, you're gonna say the Dark Knight was a technical flop, money wise. Money wise, Liam, technically speaking. I think it's one of the highest grossing Dude, movies. The Dark Knight is what I'm one saying. Of... I'm saying that he, a, a good portion of his films are technically speaking, financially speaking, are technically flops. However, I don't want to get into this right now because this is going to be, we can talk about this in post-show when we can get angry at each other. Uh, <laughs> um, or like, uh, you know, I was going to say like, uh, I remember when we, Lucas and I saw Tenet and I was like, mm -hmm. uh, like Nolan's reached a point now where he's been hailed as such like one of the new great as the true great filmmakers, like one of the voices of a generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like that's really gone to his head in recent years. Um, and to be honest, uh, with what I'm hearing about Ari Aster's next project, and given he's only made two movies, I'm a little concerned that that cut that if we continue to do this whole hailing people as like this new, the true grandiose voice of a generation auteur, nothing good really comes from it. The no, filmmakers putting are only people human. on pedestals is bad for everybody. It's bad for the person on the pedestal, and it's bad for everyone below the pedestal. Yeah. But also, uh, just a ra random quick little tangent. Did you know Ridley Scott's eighty three? Yep. Yeah. I didn't know he was that old. Man, but old anyway, <laughs> um, you know, I was 
for, I mean, Liam, even, but you could say that you could say the same thing about Robert Eggers, right? Oh yeah, like, no, and I have the same I have the same things about like uh, for all I know, for all we know, uh, Dune could be a huge flop. Yeah, David. And, yeah, exactly. Dave Lowry with the Green Knight. It very well could be not yeah. great, right? Yeah, like because I mean, especially when I think of people like uh, Denis Villeneuve, who are like acclaimed as like one of the new true great filmmakers or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, I could definitely see that happening happening there. And I mean, but people who at least people agree on haven't made a bad film yet. I have reasons for why I think that's the case. Mm-hmm. Like somebody who I think of, uh, who at least uh, according to the masses hasn't made a bad film yet is somebody like PTA. But I, th- and I think what yeah. helps with him is that one, he makes movies for a pretty specific audience. And also he always, and also we often takes a break for a number of years before getting into another project. Yeah, like we're still mm. we're still waiting on his next movie, which is supposed to be coming out this year. It's called huh. Soggy Bottom. Like there's a uh, ten year gap, bet- or there's a set like a five year gap between uh, There Will Be Blood and Punch Drunk Love. Five years exactly. Mm. Yep. And even um, bef- and I've even said that like uh, one thing we need to understand is even if a filmmaker doesn't like blow our minds or anything like. We need to understand that sometimes it's okay to just not hit it out of a ballpark every time. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're just people. And like, I think kind of piggybacking off of that a little bit, a lot of, a lot of people are like, they make a really good indie movie and then they're put in charge of like a hundred million dollar movie, which yeah. is like, they, they might've had a million dollars for their, for their indie movie. And then suddenly they're putting, they're put getting put in charge of production that is 10 times or a hundred times as big. And so a lot of their brain power, a lot of their like mental capacity is going to all these new duties and all these new people and all this new information and all this money and all this pressure. So like, they're, of course, they're not going to make as good a movie, right? Like so much of their brain is being so much of the so much of their brain activity is being taken up by other things that like the the actual directing the actual storytelling becomes like a side thing yeah like look, like, look we watched business. eternals the trailer for the eternals before this mm-hmm. chloe zhao for example won best director at uh at the oscars this year and is now directing like i said the eternals and mm-hmm. that's kind of what it looks like it looks like it might be one of those things where it's just like the, the like you said the brain capacity and the mental mental power is not going to go to where it necessarily needs to. It's Another also, person I wanted to bring up for that specific thing, Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith is a, is mm-hmm. a director who Clerks was made for what? Like 20, 30, 40,000 dollars or something, Liam, and mm-hmm. like not a big movie. And then Universal was like, "Hey, why don't you come make a movie for us?" And he was like, "Oh shit. Oh shit." And and Mulrats, even Mulrats, he said he thought he was going to lose his mind because of how many people were on that set while he was making it. He's like, there are too many people on here. Exactly, and and mm-hmm. and that's just that's pretty much exactly what Lucas is talking about. Is that like, although Smith was able to take that experience and, and turn it into a, a very positive learning experience for himself because he was able to go and make larger budget films for studios um, mm-hmm. and learned a lot about filmmaking because of Mulrats. I do think there are more often than not, we do receive directors who don't, who can't comprehend well, Kevin that. Smith also just, uh, he seems to have learned in recent years, but he just doesn't want to, but he just doesn't want to leave his wheelhouse. Yeah. Like with uh, just producing films uh, and making them the way he kind of does like with his friends. Like, uh, cause I remember he turned down directing the green Hornet. Cause he said straight up that uh, after uh, the experience he had with cop out and a couple of other film sets or whatnot, he's like, I don't think I'm qualified to like do big stunts and effects like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause like, uh, like going from making a $30,000 movie with all your friends to working with an, uh, with a professional crew uh, who who's getting paid like $50 an hour, like each and like probably even more for a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And like, having having the pressure of of the a studio giving you like 50 million dollars or however much blah blah like there's there's so much new information just dumped on you yeah and i i i can't imagine how you take all that in and still make a good movie that is like true to to the movies you make yeah like i don't i don't understand i don't, I don't even know if that's i'm sure it's happened but like it cer- certainly would be impossible for me. <laughs> even yeah, I would, I would about, not do well like, with that at all. Like how uh, Ryan Johnson made a movie uh, between Brick and Looper a few years after, which was his first like studio thing, mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't care for it. And I think that might attribute to the fact that um, 
uh, was it bad? It was just the first time really working with a big crew or whatnot instead of just like yeah. doing a super lowbrow indie film. Yeah, and like 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 and and the, a shame when it comes to like new talented directors and writers and producers like coming up is there isn't really a mid tier film anymore. Like right, mid, would... mid 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 budget uh, film, I should say. Well, that's say. why something it like a Love and either... Monsters was re was refreshing for me. Yeah, it's it's like either something that's five million dollars or under, or it's or the budget's over a hundred million dollars. Like like I'm sure there are obviously there are movies in between, but like there's very very few, right. like in comparison to the other two mm -hmm. groups. Right, and even like why I always complain about how I think uh, things like uh, uh, what is it uh, this is related to what you were saying, Lucas, but like why I think the Marvel movies look as bland and lack voices as much as they do. Mm -hmm. is because like Disney and all of them have been hiring people where I'm like, are these really the people you're going to give like huge, um, massive projects to mm -hmm. like uh, Veruso's like, like before uh, they did, um, what do you call it? Uh, civil or not civil war. What's it called? Uh, Winter, Winter Soldier. Soldier. But like Winter. the reason why they don't have their own style or their own voice or style is because they never got the chance to develop one. All they had yeah, done was just they'd... work on sitcoms. Like, uh, yeah, and sitcoms did... are not exactly known for having like <laughs> uh, uh, unique aesthetics. <laughs> Unless you're the good place. Unless you're the good place, yeah. Yeah, like because they had done episodes for Community and uh, Arrested, Arrested Development. Development. Mm -hmm. um, or even like, uh, I'm trying to think of another good example. Yeah, I mean, like, like obviously Josh Trank kind of imploded. Okay. Well, Josh <laughs> Trank, I, I, when uh, you think, put all this into perspective, it's like, no wonder Josh Trank lost his mind. Yeah. Honestly, I don't like, uh, like, it, it doesn't give him an excuse for behaving the way that he did. No. But like, also, I can't really blame him for going for going a little off the deep end. Like, like, he, he had only made a couple small movies before, if, if even a couple, I can't remember how many. Yeah. I mean, once uh, you're given that much access to cocaine. Like, yeah, you're really going to fucking implode. <laughs> and honestly, that is another thing. Uh, aside from just the pressure and all the new connections and everything, like, there's a lot of new influences in your life once you're big in Hollywood, and one of them is drugs. Yeah. Like, and, uh, Hollywood, some people can handle that, some people can't. And Hollywood is also, we've learned over the years, a true enabler and breeding ground for bad behavior and acting like a jerk to get ahead. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like, um, you know, you know, who's another one, sorry, uh, Lucas, that we were talking like in terms of like imploding on, the, on themselves is, is David Ayer is a good example as well. That's true. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause like with, <clears throat> after Suicide Squad came in, he kind of became like a, a whiny, like director where he's like, nobody liked my movie. And it's just I'm like, go to Netflix and make bright now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and like, 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 I think, I think, I think like all of these things that we've talking about probably play a part probably to different extents depending on the person right uh but like i forgot what i was gonna say sorry yeah <laughs> we mostly talked about modern directors fyi I mean, i'm mm -hmm. pretty sure there's there's hundreds of thousands of them like we could probably talk about charlie chaplin we could probably talk about um, like um or, a lot of the even kubrick we could oh, talk about i like, thought of, you or, i you, thought of an old uh, an older or at least new hollywood director or one who kind of comes up a fair bit. Look at Terry Gilliam. Mm, yeah. Like, when was the last time Terry Gilliam made a movie that a lot of people liked? Right. Yeah. A lot. Well, like the Don yeah, Quixote one, like, really flopped. Mm -hmm. Um. Or, uh. Well, I mean, this is partially a personal life thing, but Luke Besson. Mm. Like, yeah. oh, what's a yeah, yeah, yeah. what's a movie a Luke Besson movie that people actually like? Like after the Fifth Element? Yeah. After None. Leon or the Fifth Element? I don't think yeah, there's don't. a single one. He made Lucy, right? Yeah, and I hated that movie. Yeah, that was, that, that movie, was not a good movie. It frustrated the shit out of me. <laughs> um, I can't even think of, of, of the movies that he did after that. Um, he did that one movie with uh, I think it was like Arthur and the Minimoys or something, mm. where it's like the kids okay. and the, yep. the kid shrinks down in the garden or whatnot, and there's like these little microscopic people. He made yeah. all three of those movies, and I didn't even know there were two, more than one. Yep, <laughs> and I think maybe. With with the way the system works and and just the way like uh, our, our society is running everything, people who find a break in a creative field feel enormous pressure to pursue that. Right. You know what I mean? Like even even if like maybe maybe they just wanted to make one movie, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh no, this is my career now. Fuck, what do I do? I guess I'll make another one. I don't know what's going to be about. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I feel like that might play a part in some things. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people like go into it wanting a career, but someone might not necessarily, they might think they want a career in film, but not 
but not like really yeah like they're like oh that'd be cool make movies for a living yeah that's neat i think drew and goddard then, is a good example of that mm-hmm. where he's like he's like i didn't really want to direct anything and then yeah. he made cabin in the woods and people really liked it um mm-hmm. and then he was like oh man now i gotta direct more well, he only yeah. made he's only directed one film since and that was yeah. uh bad times of yell royale yeah, and how mm-hmm. long after was that like eight years later or something i feel like, like drew wild. goddard has played the smart route kind of like uh what I, I think more directors should be encouraged, which is again that you don't need to just immediately go in and make another one right after uh You're not like, DJ um, Khaled, yeah. Or even like uh look at um what was it like uh there was a five year gap between uh Looper and the and uh The Last Jedi. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh David Fincher hadn't made a movie in so long until just last year. Mm, right. And even then I could yeah, tell with just watching some of his movies, but I was like Fincher seems like he may just need a little bit of a break. <laughs> I need a minute. I just need a um, minute. Yeah, like I people mean, get burnt out. That's another thing too. And uh, even like some people have enjoy found enjoyment in doing other things, like Coppola. Like, well, part of his problem is that he went bankrupt. Yeah. And had like all of that, <laughs> but he also just seems to enjoy like uh, hanging out with his friends and family, just making wine, drinking, making yeah. wine. Um, James yeah. Cameron uh, became almost more of an explorer now and a uh, entrepreneur than a uh, filmmaker. And he's like, mm-hmm. I might as well film it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised um, if, if, uh, if, uh, what is it? Pandora is actually a real planet and he's been there and that's just what it looks like. <laughs> um, he just left the planet without anybody, or, without anybody yeah. noticing. <laughs> even like, uh, and remember even go, I was going to say, or even like, uh, sorry, actors the only be- person who noticed was Catherine Bigelow because he stopped paying alimony payments. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> go I, mean, I was going to say, there even, uh, actors who have become directors and have just become overwhelmed due to that. Like, uh, like, again, when I heard about what was going, like, with the reason Live by Night bombed or whatnot, uh, Ben Affleck's uh, uh, fourth film, when I heard about everything that went into that, I was like, no shit, this was gonna, yeah. that wasn't, this wasn't gonna go over well. Yeah, I, like, I have very limited experience in the film industry, but even with that limited experience on a pretty minimal level, I can see how people get overloaded really quickly. Yep. Yeah. especially especially creative people like inherent like like people whose like primary focus is being creative well they get they get they get slapped with all this like management and and like business and like all these things that might it's probably not in their skill set or their wheelhouse and suddenly they have to learn all that and making the movie is kind of in the background and i i, I totally see why these things happen yeah like remember when we made a bigfoot movie we did, <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't direct a movie for four years after that. <laughs> uh, and, or even yeah, like some people uh, need, just need time to recharge. Yeah, the, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why this stuff happens. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's just like, again, there's like like the re- the whole fact that there's so much why this happens. There's also again to take into a point that there's so much that goes on in the making of a film, like so many other contributing factors. Yeah. That like it's not sometimes it's not even always just on the director or the screenwriter or whatnot. There's could be a lot of other contributing factors to oh, like. Sure. And uh, to be honest, we've kind of in recent year or a lot of recent years developed a shaming culture when uh, movies don't live up to our expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like uh, which uh, just breed which just breeds more and more issues like this. Mm-hmm. For sure, one hundred percent. Cool. Well, I feel like we've beat this dead horse quite with another dead horse uh <laughs> and then it stopped shitting out money lucas will get that reference <laughs> uh, anyway uh yeah so this the train has rolled into the station thank you for listening to this episode of the thundercast we're not we're not at the end we gotta go to a very fun special wonderful game that we like to play at the end of every single episode what is that game cool cool goddamn right it's cool wars we'll be right back Well, since we're having yeah, this conversation, well, he 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 killed he killed or displaced uh, a third of the world's population. Anyway, sorry. No worries. I was like, yeah, let's let's really bring down the, the emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how many people fucking died. <laughs> All right, ready? yeah, I was gonna say he may have gone yeah. bad, but I don't think George Lucas killed a bunch of people <laughs> once. 
All right, hello, welcome back to the Thundercast t- number two hundred and nine on Brazil's uh, TV reviews uh, <laughs> on Apple a- on Apple Podcast TV review podcast. We are number two hundred and nine. So thank apparently you for- last week we were two hundred and seven, but we went down two spots. We went down two spots. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we are here with another fantastic and fun edition of Cool Wars. Cool Wars. Oh, they didn't do it. Cool Wars. <laughs> that one felt forced. It felt forced. Uh, cool Wars is a game we like to play at the end of every single episode of the Thundercast in which we pit two characters up against each other based off of a list of entirely arbitrary um, uh, characters that we have created. Uh, we pit these two people up against each other in a battle of coolness. Coolness is evaluated off of the of every single definition of the word cool. Um, if you want to look that up, go for it on your own. I'm not going to do the explanation anymore. Uh, these people are not fighting. There is no fist fight. It is purely just a battle of cool. If it were a fist fight, this one would probably be over pretty fast. That's right, Liam. <laughs> Who do we have on the docket today? Um, today on the bracket we have uh, uh Batman, specifically Kevin Conroy's Batman, uh, versus Thor, particularly uh Chris Hemsworth Hemsworth Thor because he's probably the one everybody knows the best. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Put the eight minutes on the clock for us, Liam. All right. And here we go. Leah, Lucas did the same <laughs> thing today when we were playing Valheim. I, yeah, I did. It's true. All right. All right. Thor versus Batman. Kevin Conroy, Batman. Obviously, just by virtue of being Batman, is cool. Yeah. Um, Kevin Conroy's voice, very cool. So, I mean, it's still the voice that I always hear in my head when I read Batman or whenever I think Batman. Mm-hmm. But there is one thing. People always do the whole, uh, was it, he's cool because he's Batman thing. But we should probably say, why do we think Batman is cool? Hmm, I, I like Batman because he kind of, he represents a lot of what's wrong with uh, people who, not wrong, but people who are not properly, who, people who are mentally ill but who are not properly helped and and guided through the process and start to turn that that thing into their mental illness into a superpower in some regards. So he plays both sides of the coin, right? Where it's like it is kind of a negative thing because of of how he's being treated and how he's treating mm-hmm. himself and how he never yeah. actually properly by real world standards properly dealt with his grief. Right, but in a, mm-hmm. in a way also finds a way to channel his grief, you know? Mm-hmm. as becoming batman um i i also think the whole like standing up for corruption and moral justice and batman from batman the animated series because that's kind of who we're talking about the most for the most part um doesn't kill people is is pretty good at at upholding the law and he has being... a very cold exterior and a very uh intense drive but he also is very much a person who very much does genuinely care about life and uh, understands the value of it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Like uh, there's actually this great scene in um, uh, Justice League Unlimited where uh, there's um, this uh, essentially the character Ace who is slowly dying because she has a, tu- uh, was it she- a tumor is developed in her brain and her psychic powers are causing the whole world to like tear apart. And Batman sent in uh, by Amanda Waller telling him, you have to go kill Ace. And literally all he does is he sits down on the swing with her and talks to her and she agrees to put to stop but she says can you just wait with me here while i die Ugh. and batman <laughs> just sits down with her and compassionately stays by her side until uh, her tumor inevitably takes her life oh it's so sad that was fucking really sad Liam. That was, yeah <laughs> uh, lucas why do you think batman is cool he looks cool he's got a cape <laughs> I think there is also the things that I will always take away from Batman like again taking grief and trying to do the best that you can with it yeah um like uh and it, again just taking the idea taking your demons and trying to turn them into a positive and like just pushing yourself to the absolute best pars- possible way you could be yeah like I, I was telling Lucas and Liam earlier that I'm playing Batman Arkham Origins right now I don't believe that's Conroy is it in mm-hmm. Origins it is Conroy I believe so. Uh, well, they did not give him the best Batman because that Batman is a total fucking douchebag. And it <laughs> pisses me off beyond belief. But yeah. what's cool about uh, Thor is big man swing hammer. <laughs> I mean, Thor does, at least Chris Hemsworth's take on Thor does have a legitimate like charm to him. 
but like he's a bit of an until era. like the third or fourth appearance of him. I don't know. Even when know, he I first think, show... in the first one, I think he has his a uh, certain level of charm. I think he is. He's, he's a, a bit of an arrogant. Elf. He's a bit of an arrogant ass- asshole, but he mm. also is like a, he's he's a himbo. He's a big guy with a bit of a with a genuine heart. Yeah. Even mm-hmm. if his arrogance does overshadow it, and himbo himbos do nothing for me. So I feel <laughs> I feel like I've already kind of answered this, but there um, you go. yeah, no. He's 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 much nicer than the uh, the actual Norse god Thor. <laughs> <He's right. laughs> um, the biggest thing I've always had with Thor in uh, uh was it that uh, the movies never really figured out is that I at least from my perspective reading Thor is that Thor himself like is he's charming he's fun but he's not especially interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Thor's kind of like Robin Hood or like the Earl or like Conan or the early uh, King Arthur stories where it's not really about them as a character but. More so the adventures they go on and the crazy things they encounter. Right. Yeah, I, I think Thor would... I think the Thor movies, I think Ragnarok started to get it right. But, like, Thor needs to be going to other worlds. Like, the character himself is not super interesting, but, like, what he can do and where he can go can be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and like, putting a man out of place is what mm-hmm. makes Thor himself interesting. That's why, like... I mean, I don't like it, but that's why a lot of people like the first Thor movie is because he's mm-hmm. a man completely displaced. Yeah, he's the fish out of water. Yeah, the fish yeah. out of water. The whole whole entire per, uh, persona behind Thor is that mm-hmm. very much. Also, a big old hammer that can summon lightning is a lot of fun. That's pretty neat. <laughs> and then he gets a big old axe that can summon yeah. lightning. <laughs> the biggest yeah, thing that, cool turned, that turned me away from Thor in the later films is that I thought he became way too himbo to a point mm-hmm. where it seemed like he was very detached from everything, like in as much as I do enjoy Ragnarok, there are a lot of points where it's like, it doesn't really seem like Thor understands the stakes or what's really going on. He just seems like <laughs> that's, he'd, be, that's fair. he'd just be as content at home, sitting on the couch, eating chips. Which and is what we see eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and like, going back to Batman a little bit, I think Batman, I, I agree with pretty much everything you guys said, but also to go on a little, little bit of a simpler level, uh, Batman's aesthetic is just awesome. Hmm. Like he he's he's a very striking figure with like the flowing cape and even the little ears are fun. Like, <laughs> I mean, like at first when you put like two little triangle ears on a person, you're gonna be like, okay, that's it's pretty. That's not gonna that's not gonna work. That's yeah. gonna be silly. Also, but it as works. As a lifelong Batman. Batman fan, one thing <laughs> that will always uh, hold uh, close to me with Batman is the fact that my favorite interpretation of Batman has always been the idea of the world's greatest detective, not really the brawler, not the ninja. But like, um, like I'm a sucker for hard boiled detective stories. Yeah. And like just seeing like what was always cool and what was always cool about Batman, it wasn't that he was armed of a teeth or that he would go and it's that he could use his mind or whatnot and just go into a room with people that are armed of a teeth and just uh and just kick their ass in spite of that. Mm-hmm. Like uh that's and also just without killing them. Like if there, if there's one rule I will always have about Batman, it's that he does not kill and he does not use fucking guns. Mm-hmm. Giving Batman a gun makes him less capable, in my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Zack Snyder can really eat it on that one. Um, yeah. Or where are we at, Lane? We got like forty-five uh, seconds left. Uh, we are at uh one minute. We have one minute left. You're pretty close. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah, I think I'm. I'm ready I mean, to call it. I'm ready to call it. Uh, one defense I will also give Thor is that he does also have a pretty cool aesthetic. Like I'm personally partial to, uh, I don't like the sleeveless uh, Thor. Like we get in the later films. I like where mm-hmm. he has like the chain mill armor. Mm-hmm. And, Thor like, also really kind of right has thing. two pointy triangles on his head. When he wears his helmet, which he rarely mm-hmm. does for some reason. Yeah. I also like, uh, I also like that he got like the full Viking beard in, in Endgame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's call it. All right. Ready? Um, yep. Three, two, two, one. one. Batman. That Batman. No duh. <laughs> like we've been put, we've been putting this off for since we, we started been. Cool Wars because it was obvious who was yeah. gonna win. <laughs> yeah, like the, the the matchups are mostly randomized, mm. and yeah. when that came up, it's like Batman's gonna win. Yeah, it's like, hard. We even need <laughs> we even need to do some restructuring with some of some of them because we have two in a few brackets. We have characters from the exact same show or medium. Yeah. 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 Might need to switch some stuff up, but uh, mo- for the most part, aside from like rebalancing things, these uh, matchups are randomized. Yes. Almost but, entirely. Yeah. yeah. Some of them have been fudged. Fine. We also yeah. need to stop. <laughs> we also st- need to stop attaching characters from movies we've never seen. <laughs> That's a good point too. Lucas, you want to take us out of here? 
For sure. If you guys enjoyed what you heard, uh, please follow us on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We are Thunder Lizard Collective. On Twitter, we are Thunder Lizard OG. And on Patreon, we are uh, at www.patreon.com slash Thunder Lizard. Please follow us on there if you if you feel so inclined. Donate to our Patreon. Uh, become a subscriber and stuff like that. Uh, and again, if you like this, please tell your friends, share us on social media, follow us on Spotify, give us five stars on iTunes, and uh, same things, follow us at five stars on equivalent streaming platforms. We also have another show uh, called Thunder and Dragons, aka TND, where I am the Thunder Master, aka Dungeon Master, for these two and our friend Dan as we uh, adventure through uh, the realm uh, of... of my world where they are gods and of course thank you thank you so much to all of our patrons kate tanya scott manos and owen yes that's right thank you so much for everybody we really appreciate you this has been episode 58 of the thundercast 59 uh, 58 i believe we're on 58, 58. yeah yeah 58 <laughs> can't even fuck it'll say down there behind, <laughs> underneath liam look underneath liam that'll t- yeah. end in the description yeah, you guys you guys probably know better than we do you you would probably know anyway um this has been the thundercast for this week my name is christian my name is lucas and i'm liam see ya george doesn't know <laughs> uh, hello uh Please keep quiet. I'm making a movie for myself in the garage. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.